The reason I want to talk about Georgia is because we're continuing in this series of what coaches have said anonymously about certain football teams, and there are teams that we care just a little bit more about than we do others. And one of those is Georgia because not unlike Ohio State or Alabama, it feels like this is a magic year for them. This is a year for which they need to get it done. This is a year for where, at the very least, they need to play in the SEC championship game again and make the college football playoff. That's what they are geared up to do, but they are going to have to replace quite a bit. They lost five starters on the offense. Jake Fromm, of course, he who has already got clapped back by one of his best friends via screenshot text message. Yo, he was borderline about to get cut by a Buffalo, but he's probably going to get cut by a Buffalo anyway because, well, you don't take a quarterback in the fifth round because you think he's going to be good. You don't take a quarterback in the sixth round because you think he's going to be good. Same thing with Tom Brady. He turned out to be good. Now find me some other six-round quarterbacks that have won Super Bowl. Oh, wait. All right. So DeAndre Swift at running backs, that's a huge loss for them, workhorse for them. And then on the offensive line, they have three starters that they lose in Isaiah Thomas, excuse me, Andrew Thomas, Isaiah Wilson, and Solomon Kinley. And then they lost the transfer in Cade Mays to Tennessee because, among other things, <laughs> so Cade Mays' daddy sits down at a recruiting event. There they got stadium chairs, and his finger gets caught in the pinch point where this slide of the where, the, where the chair seat come up. And he lost his pinky finger. Sam Pittman, who was offensive line coach at the time, takes pinky finger, puts it on ice. And you know what? Uh, now K. Mays' daddy is a suing Georgia. Needless to say, the Mays boys, they go back to Tennessee, right? So you lose those guys, but you added Jamie Newman. 2,868 yards passing, 26 touchdowns, 574 yards on the ground. He adds a mobile dimension to the quarterback room for Georgia. And as Georgia has tried to continue to play murder ball like their Alabama to circa 2009, that's also been their downfall because they can't score from behind just running the damn ball. Even as they have on their hats down there at Sanford Stadium, run the ball. And they spell ball B-A-W-L. I really love it, right? But you get Zamir White, James Cook, Kenny McIntosh, Kendall Milton, Dejan, Dejan Warren. Like, they're loaded with the backfield, so it's kind of the year for them to run the football, but if you could throw it to George Pickens, you're going to be in good shape. Problem is, who else are you going to throw it to other than George Pickens, right? You need to find out who is another target where you can go to at the very least because you're not going to have Dominique Blaylock who blew out his ACL last year. On the defense, man, look, cornerbacks, Eric Stokes and Keely Ringo, they're going to be all right. Richard LeCount is the man. But what we have seen is how are they going to adapt is a big issue when we're talking about what coaches are saying about them. And what one coach said anonymously about them this year is pertaining to their offense and Todd Monk and saying, quote, everything is focused on their offense. DeAndre Swift is gone and so is most of the OL. But the whole key is going to be the quarterback play. Jamie Newman is completely different than what they've done in the past. So expect a quarterback run game and RPOs, not as much drop back, maybe none. How can they adapt that offense to fit his skill set? Will they bend with that? With Todd Munkin, they will be different, but how much so depends on what the kid can handle. Again, wise words there, because now you're talking about a grad transfer quarterback that has not actually been able to take real significant snaps in a new offense that they're still trying to install in a year where Todd Munkin is supposed to help overhaul this offense into something like a passing attack that can combat schools like Alabama, like LSU, right? And run roughshod over Florida once again. If there's only one thing to be said about how good or bad Jake Fromm was at Georgia, all we need to do is remind Florida fans that he is undefeated in the world's largest cocktail party. That's what Jamie Newman is trying to do. He's trying to go 1-0, and kind of like Jalen Hurts of Texas, just trying to get it done, trying to get it in, trying to get it out. All right, I guess that, right? But defensively, it's Kirby Marsh show with Dan Lanning. And, man, goodness, like their staff is so good. Like I know that Dan Lanning is getting a lot of press, and he should. But it wasn't too long ago that Mel Tucker was the dude. And Kirby Smart just continues to find guys 
that know what kind of a defense he wants to run while also having a tremendous amount of hands-on with his safety coaches and or with the safeties and with the defense backs. Now, what one coach said anonymously about the defense is, quote, I think defensively will be as good as they are always, or they'll be as good as they are always. They're great at never making you comfortable. For as athletic as they are, they're still smart, meaning that they're going to throw different coverages at you, maybe more than necessary. You get nothing for free against Kirby Smart. Goes on. The nose tackle, Jordan Davis, is dominant. The discipline and the front and linebackers have looked a little bit more like those Bama-era Kirby defenses. Every year since he's been there, longer and faster, longer and faster, they can drop into coverage. They can play big boy stuff on the run. They'll have to be at another level this year, but the pressure to win in Atlanta is going to be real for them with their defense having to do most of the leading. And then certainly you're going to see an identity crisis, right? And when that crops up, what are you going to do with it? You could kind of understand their offensive methodology with those backs that they have where they're going to try to run the football and run pro style stuff, pro style stuff being like early 2000s, late 90s stuff. But the problem with that is, do you get too predictable? And I think that's an interesting point to make. I think it's an interesting point to make because what we know is that the talent will equal out the SEC at the upper echelon at the top. And if South Carolina, who went 4-8 and eight last year, can go into Sanford and jack for your hedges in broad daylight, anybody can jump up and bite you. Now, that's what Kirby Smart would have you believe. But we also remember the Monsoon Bowl that was played between Kentucky and Georgia. And Lynn Bowden nearly won that football game for them against Georgia. So, yeah, I think that being predictable is a big part of this. But also, perhaps we're seeing Kirby Smart have the same sort of, well, light bulb moment that Nick Saban had. Which is to say, yo, did we just watch Joe Burrow, Joe friggin' Burrow carve us up in the SEC championship game in our backyard? Did that just happen? Because it feels like that just happened. That just happened? Yeah, man, that just happened. And that's kind of like what Nick Saban had with Johnny Manziel, Johnny Football, Texas A&M, redshirt freshman. Going off in Tuscaloosa, and then you you saw it real quick. Now, nah, man, I'm modernizing the offense. I'm bringing in dual threat quarterbacks. Lane Kiffin, come on down. We get we got to we got to get it on pop because I can't I can't I can't do this anymore. I can't watch us get carved up by a dual threat quarterback and not be able to throw my own dual threat quarterback back at him. And you know what Jake Fromm isn't dual threat. You know what Jake Jacob Eason wasn't dual threat. You know what Justin Fields was. Dual threat. Like, he had this dude. He had a dude that was Justin Fields. He had a Heisman finalist on the roster behind Jake Fromm. And what he's got now is store brand Cam Newman. He's got store brand Cam Newton. And he's, he's hoping that store brand Cam Newton can be what Justin Fields was. But he ain't gonna be what Justin Fields was. Cause he's store brand Cam Newton. He's not actual Cam Newton. He's not even actual Justin Fields. So I'm really kind of hype. I'm, I'm kind of hype about this because I I like the idea of a defensive minded coach being driven mad by an offensive weapon, by a singular offensive weapon. Because I was here for the Kyler Murray experience, and being here for the Kyler Murray experience led to my favorite quote of the 2018 season, which is to say, it wasn't the Dragon Ball Z celebrations that C.D. Lamb and Hollywood Brown were throwing in the end zone that should have been a talk of the town. Shouldn't have even been how Kennedy Brooks was able to run rough shot through Gary Patterson's 4-2-5 defense, which is, you know, not a small thing. It should have been how Kyler Murray could do anything he wanted. Absolutely, positively anything he wanted. And there was nothing that Gary Patterson could do to stop it. There was no coverage he could throw. There was no blitz he could throw. There was no guidance he could give to his defensive backs, to his linebackers, to his defensive line. He was just over there with his towel, sweating harder than normal because he's watching Kyler Murray in his number one jersey, five foot ten quarterback, just eat him up. And so he goes into the press conference. And what we know about Gary Patterson is that when he wants to do playoff P, which is to be most quotable and open to everybody, like he is a like say Big Twelve media days, where he's going, yo, let's talk, let's do it, whatever. He's awesome. So his quote about Kyler Murray will always stick with me. And that quote was, it's recess and it's full blast. (laughs) 
I love it, man. Because, like, it ain't like, even when they went 5-7 and seven last year, I'm not prepared to say that they're a bad football team. They just lost seven games, right? And because you beat Texas, hello, you should have beat Baylor. Like, that game was awesome. I remember watching that game as I'm getting ready to drive down to Norman with my buddy Steve Bullard to cover game. And, you know, we got that game on our iPad, on the phone, on the radio. Like, we try to get it in, try to get it done, try to figure out, or is this the day that Charlie Brewer falls? And look at true freshman Max Dugan. Max Dugan getting it done. Now, he's not going to have Jalen Rager and whatnot, but he is going to have Zach Evans, which is one of the reasons why I've been trying to tell people y'all better watch out for one Zach Evans and Texas Christian. Y'all, y'all better do that because I, I feel like the way that people are talking about Oklahoma State is the way you ought to be talking about TCU and Gary Patterson because to date, the only team that has been consistently able to put up 35 when they want to put up 35 on TCU is 100% Oklahoma and nobody else. TCU is prepared to give Texas the business because they gave them the business last year. And nobody likes beating Texas in this league more than Gary Patterson. Not even Lincoln Riley. Lincoln Riley has to win that game. It's like it's like how Ryan Day feels about beating Michigan. It ain't that you feel good about it. It's that you feel a tremendous sense of relief because you know what we're going to have to say to you if you lose that game. Meanwhile, Gary Patterson knows Texas Christian is Texas Christian. Nobody remembers that they were one of the first schools to integrate. Nobody remembers that this small private school in Fort Worth was able to hold its own in the Southwest Conference for so long. And then what the Boise State of its time in the Mountain West. Nobody remembers that 07 come down here and busted up five stoops' win streak. Nobody remembers that. It was 05. 07, 05. Because, like, Oregon was 2006. Man, that was a rough stretch in there. It's a rough stretch. But Gary knows how to do this. And Gary's coming up on year number 19 as head coach at TCU. And he's been doing it with a bunch of dudes that nobody else is recruiting and a bunch of dudes that are playing out of position, according to him. Like, my man went into West Texas to recruit L.J. Collier. L.J. Collier from a small school, uh, from a place that didn't produce much of anything, made him into a first-round draft pick at defensive end. Okay? The man talked Ty Summers out of playing quarterback at Rice, playing Division one quarterback into playing linebacker at TCU and then defensive end and then back to linebacker. That's how I got his nickname of Captain America. You know, you got to be so hard to get the nickname of Steve Rogers as a, as a, as a football player. Cause you know, there's it, not going to be any small conversations about who is Captain America on a football team. Just like there's not going to be any small conversations about who is Black Panther. At sports, you looking at it or listening to him. That's me, T'Challa. Y'all can fight over the rest. But uh, when it comes to the king of Wakanda, I'm going to fight you for that, right? Can you imagine what it would take for somebody to go up to another person and be like, what's up, Cap? And not be Colin Kaepernick or not have Captain his name? Even then, like Captain Morgan, that, you got you to say the full name, right? I'm just, I want that out there to show you what Gary Patterson can do when Gary Patterson's team knows who it is and what it can be. We keep forgetting Jeff Gladney was he was a hard worker. We keep forgetting that. You know, also that I know there's somebody out there going, "What about Texas Tech?" Yeah, show me that Alan Bowman shows up, uh, holds up for the whole year because Alan Bowman could be Charlie Brewer 2.0. Losing Jet Duffy is gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt. L- losing. L- Losing Tajon Henry is going to hurt. And then Keith Patterson is going to have to figure out how to make this work without do everything middle linebacker Jordan Brooks, who quite literally was in on everything, and that's why he was drafted in the first round. And everybody was focusing on Eli Howard and Douglas Coleman when they should have been focusing on Jordan Brooks because he's actually the dude making it happen out there. 